There's only 16 miles until the service stop. Miles and miles of Black Street Road. Dan Old here, and we are at Los Alamos National Lab, and with the eminent Gary Greider, who's been involved in HPC since what, what did you say, 1981? Correct. And you've been to 29 of the 30 SCs. That's right. Which is incredible, and you're going to the next one. I will be there. Okay, I will Saturday. Too. You driving? No. You want to ride with me? Um, Stop by Sandia? No. Oh, no. <laughs> There's not a lot between here and there. <laughs> so, so you've seen a lot in your career, and I guess I just want to start with a broad open question. Where do you see HPC going? Oh, that's that's a good question. So, um, you know, HPC is is uh, gone a lot of directions in the last thirty years, but um, it's interesting right now. The um, the Exascale project is interesting. Yes. And they're you know doing a lot of funding and and building a lot of machines. Um, it's kind of unfortunate that um, the machines that they're building are are all really highly well suited for. Um, you know, dense arithmetic, dense algebra, Limpac. Limpac. Yeah. Um but but other kinds of applications that that's, that are well suited in that environment, machine learning and things like that, that are typically pretty dense, pretty easily parallelizable, and the pieces that are harder to tackle aren't being tackled very well, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, dense or non-dense, you know, sparse, uh, irregular, very very hard problems. And More like an HPCG then. HPCG is a is a is, is a good approximation for streams, so it's a good approximation for memory bandwidth. Um, and yes, so... Uh, it's a sparse matrix, isn't it? It is a sparse matrix. Um, and so, but it's um, not necessarily all that irregular, and, okay. and it's not multiple pieces of physics going on at once. And so it's a, it's a, a baby step towards a representation of a real, you know, real simulation. Um, and and yeah, if you look at the machines that are being built, they're you know maybe one percent efficient on HPCG. Yes. And so we're buying you know exaflops worth of machines, and we're getting petaflops worth of actual use, right? Which is scary, right? It's a it's a big deal. Uh, if you're you know there are applications that get 20, 30, 50, 90 percent you know um, use if they're dense and they don't, they're pretty regular, um, they're very parallelizable. But if not. Um, you know, and it's kind of diminishing returns and has been for a while. We're designing machines today for, um, for workloads, for subsets of workloads of the future, I think, right? Okay. I mean, machine learning and, you know, is the memory version of Hadoop in a way, right? Okay. And, yeah. and it's very parallelizable, the training phase at least. And um, the, there's no huge dependency graphs, or at least not yet. Eventually they may get there. And so, um, so, it's, you know, I think we're building machines for, we're building machines how we know how to build machines. Okay, that's a better way to do it. And we're trying to figure out how to make software run on them well. And some software will, mm -hmm. and some software may never run very well on them. And so, um, where, do I, where do I think HPC is headed? I think one path of HPC is absolutely headed in that direction, full speed ahead. Um, and lots of money and lots of big machines are being built for that. And, and that's not a bad thing, it's just a thing. Mm -hmm. um, I think that um, what we're trying to do here is actually go the other way. Uh -huh. So we're actually trying to figure out, okay, instead of building machines how we know how to build machines and pounding the software into making it work on them, that's one version of co-design, right? I sure. redesign the software to work on whatever hardware I know how to build. Sure. Another version is to um, try to build hardware slightly different to mate up better with the application. And so that's the approach we're taking, and we are almost unique in that regard right now. Um, and with and, Sierra and being the latest example of that? Sierra is, the, is a Livermore machine. Oh, I'm sorry. And what, and what is Sierra? Sierra is a big GPU machine. Yes. And what's it going to run really well? It's going to run dense applications really well, True. right? True. And so, um, the, uh, and, and, you know, frankly, there's a difference between our workload and Livermore's workload. Livermore's workload, you know, they do an awful lot of VNV and quality assurance and those sorts of things, which end up being ensemble type calculations. Mm -hmm. And so it is quite parallelizable. And so it may be a good machine for them. It probably won't be a good machine for us because we actually 
you know, certify 75 or 80 percent of the stockpile. So almost all of our applications are simulation and not necessarily mm. verification kinds of applications. We do that verification too, but the mix is really different from, from here to there. And so we typically run a, a big calculation on half of the machine, a petabyte of memory for six months. Wow. We're probably the only site in the world that does that. Go to Oak Ridge, they've got a petabyte of memory too, mm. but they would never give it to a single application for six months. That just, they can't do that. Yeah. They're an Office of Science site. They've got to give time to everybody, right? Six They're, months for a single app with a petabyte of memory. Yes, That's 24 true. hours a day f for six months to get, up, to get to an answer. Yeah. And in fact, that problem we had been trying to run for the last decade. We tried to run it on Cielo and it wouldn't run. We tried to run it on Sequoia, which was a blue jean machine at Livermore for a long time. We never got anywhere there. We finally ran it on Trinity. We finally got a machine built big enough with yeah. enough memory and enough, you know, a, a, the right kind of architecture to run it. And frankly, it's an important problem. And you know what we learned by running that problem? We're 10 times too small to even figure it out. So we need a 10 times bigger footprint memory machine. Um, and we need to run the job for six months on that machine. Of course, we don't own that machine. Hopefully someday we will. Um, and so at any rate, our, our workload is different. Mm. And you know, every site's workload is slightly different. And because ours is the preponderance of what we do is these very large scale simulations that have at any one time you know, 10 to 20 physics packages running simultaneously inside the application. There may be multiple link scales going on. Some of it may be running at molecular level and some of it at continuum level, all in the same application, all at exactly the same time, right? So it's highly irregular. And so trying to, f trying to pound those kinds of applications into a dense linear algebra, embarrassingly parallel mecha mechanism just is not in the cards. It, we'll, we'll never get there. So your standard CPU, GPU, it's a bad fit. Well, the GPU at least. Okay. Um, CPUs are much better at being interrupted. Yes. Right? They're much better at speculative processing. They're much better at those kinds of things. And so right now, it's looking like c CPUs are kind of the answer for us. For you guys. Yeah. However, um, even CPUs aren't really wonderful because our memory bandwidth is so crappy, right? And I mean, you know, the memory bandwidth per amount of flops is, you know, it's a tenth of a byte per flop. How many bytes per flop was a Cray-1? Three words, 24 bytes per flop. Mm. Two 64-bit quantities coming in and the 64-bit quantity going out. Three words every cycle. How many cycles? I mean, you, now it's like 0.1 bytes per flop. Mm. That's the memory bandwidth into a modern-day processor. And of course, they've got I big cache. Like oh, that. it's that got awful. Incredible. It's incredibly bad. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's horrible. And, and our applications, because they're so, they float over the entirety of memory. There's no hot spot. We need to sweep over the whole memory every time, right? And yeah. so uh, we get really, really crappy efficiencies, just horrible efficiencies, because there's not enough memory bandwidth. And that's the first sin. And so we've got to fix the memory bandwidth problem. So that's what we're going to go after. Mm -hmm. The other piece that's very important is latency. What happens when you get a miss? You're going through and then you hit an indirect reference in the code and, it, and, and that's not a, a thing you want to uh, multiply. That's an address of somebody else. You've got to jump somewhere else in memory to get the thing you want to go multiply with, right? Mm -hmm. Indirect references like that. Well, if you think about these really icky codes that have 30 physics packages and stuff, they're going to want to use a lot of indirection to make those programs tractable. Sure. So there's a ton of indirection in the codes. And so every time you turn around, you've got to face a latency hit. You know how many cycles you wait waiting for a latency hit? Thousands. Wow. So you're at 0.1 or 0.01 percent efficient during that piece of the code simply because you're hopping around in memory, grabbing, you know, locations. Right. We, we're not we're not unique in that particular no. problem. That problem is manifests itself in large scale graph problems too. Mm -hmm. But um, nonetheless, that's where we live. We live in this world where we need memory bandwidth more than we need flops. And we need memory latency fixes more than we need flops. Memory bandwidth can be fixed. You can throw money at it. You can use HBM. You can move the memory closer to the processor. There's all kinds of things you could do. 3D integration. And so there's things you can do about memory bandwidth. With memory latency, largely that's physics. You can only go so fast. So, yeah. But there's tricks. 
And it turns out they're old tricks. Um, <laughs> scatter gather engines. Mm -hmm. Scatter gather engines were big on Cray XMPs and YMPs. Why? Because codes had indirection in them and you needed to put specialized hardware that would go and you would give it a list of addresses and it would go gather up the things from memory and hand you a dense thing to go do your multiplication or division on right mm -hmm. and so that kind of stuff is where we need to go so anyway so we're we're, we're working really hard over the next decade for our next couple of big machines to be highly efficient instead of being 0.1 percent efficient like we are today probably we'd like to get up to 10 percent that would be amazing to our users. And, and so we don't necessarily want a big machine here. It's not that we don't want a big machine, but we don't care. It's an efficient we machine. want a lot of science because <laughs> we got a lot of science to do. It's because if I have a one, if I got to run one problem for six months to get an answer on half of a machine, that's how, I mean, and it's 10 times too small already. I, I need a lot of, I, I don't think I could ever have that many watts in this county. I'm not sure I could have that many watts in the state, right? Wow. I, I, we got to do something about efficiency as a community, and we're the stocking horse for that because our applications drive us there. And so that's what we're doing. I wouldn't say that's necessarily where the whole industry is going because there's this huge shiny object machine learning and shiny object AI, which are great stuff. And going to do. Really solve your it does not solve it my problem. Really, now, yeah. it's not that I can't use those tools. For yeah. example, people are looking at how to use those tools to guide the application. Yeah. So you could use them maybe to analyze the output of the application, but physics you can't do with machine learning. You got to do it with simulation. Yeah. And simulation sometimes is really icky, hard, and big, nasty simulation. That certainly defines what we do, and. There's not a substitute for that. But it's, it's so, good you're pulling the industry in a direction of fixing the memory bandwidth problem. Well, so, so that that's actually helps everybody. Yes. I mean, yes. Uh, any, you know, everybody's waiting on memory bandwidth. And that's the thing that I, I had somebody, some luminary, tell me several or many years ago, that if you're doing HPC correctly, the last hurdle you're going to hit is memory bandwidth. And you're not going to fix that one. Someone and, else has to fix that one. That's why Cray ones were awesome. Yeah, they had you get you got a result every clock. Mm -hmm. You read in two sixty four bit floating point values. You did a multiplication and you wrote out one every cycle. That's unheard of today, right? You're lucky to get one one hundredth. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, more cores don't fix that. <laughs> they don't. They only fix it if you can turn if you can turn. Um, they, they help you because they generate more addresses to look up. Mm -hmm. But when you run out of memory bandwidth, you're out of memory bandwidth. Yeah. And each core can't keep a, the memory busy. A single core can't keep the memory busy because it can't generate addresses yeah. fast enough. But several cores can, and when you run out of memory bandwidth, you're out. Yes. That's all there is. And modern processors today are huddle, you know, hovering around 0.1 bytes per flop. I mean, that's incredible. And even the, the processors with more memory bandwidth, that still isn't changing that ratio very much. I'm thinking about like the power processors, the... Uh, a little. Uh, AMD. A little. It's a little bit. A little bit. For, for example, the, the, the new AMD has eight memory channels instead of six. Yeah. So, yeah, it's better. It's better by how much? Well... Like a 20, 25% better. 25% better. Something like that, yeah. You're still off by fours of magnitude. Yeah. Right? I mean, it's, yeah. So it's great. We love it. Bring more of that. That's what you can get now. But, so, yeah, um, you want that. And GPUs actually use HBM, soldered on HBM right next to the mm -hmm. processor. So they get a 4X, maybe a 5X. Of course, the only way to use a GPU is data parallel. And so if you cast your problem that way, it's great. Um, but, but, if you can't, but if you can't, you can't use that. Um, and actually, there's an interesting story about GPUs. Mm. Um, the first machine on the first top 500, or the top machine on the first top 500 list ever was here, right over there in a building. It was a CM5. Danny Hillis actually lives in Santa Fe. Um, the thinking machine, CM5. And um, 
The thinking machines was the first machine, I believe, that was ever programmed using data parallelism. Data parallelism is SIMD, mm -hmm. same instruction across lots of data, right? Mm -hmm. It's massively parallel. Um, and so that machine is kind of where, and, and its predecessor, the CM2, was where um, data parallel programming started. And it became what is now the common GPU, and CUDA is essentially a SIMD language that evolved from C star and things mm -hmm. like that, which um, came from thinking machines. So we lived, we've been there, you know, back in the 90s. We were, we were playing in that space. And in fact, we even coupled our CM5 with a YMP, okay. which, which was a, you know, a predecessor to a modern day CPU and GPU yeah. put together. Yeah, it's like a traffic They board. They were each, you know, um, quarter acre size machines <laughs> that were glued together, which mm -hmm. is not what we do today, right? It's, it's all glued together in one machine. But it's fascinating, right? That was already been done a long time ago. It just wasn't done inside of a node. It was done in two separate rooms with a big wire between them. Um, same concept. You have use a CPU for what you use a CPU for, and you use a GPU for the mass parallel thing. Same thing we were doing. We were using the, C, the CM5 for mass parallel SIMD operations, and using the, the Cray for all the integer ops and all the stuff that the. You know, it's the, like a friend of ours, mutual friend Henry Newman says, "There are no new engineering ideas, just new engineers." Yeah. That discover right. these old ideas that worked quite well in the past. Yep. So, anyway. Great stuff. Interesting well, stuff. thank you so much. Sure. I really appreciate the time. No problem. I got five.